You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts. Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management, along with Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian and Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That music can mean but one thing. Tis Thursday, tis noon central, 1 p.m. East Beck Matter Renaissance Fair, tis. <laughs> Welcome to episode due of your bi weekly options extravaganza, known as the Option Block. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever exciting Options Insider Radio Network. I will be your host, your guide, your major domo. I will lead this parade down the streets as we keep on rolling through the world of options, reminding you, of course, a lot of you like to enjoy it on demand on your platform of choice. Good news is there are more of those all the time. So if you like to evolve, or a lot of you, as we'll see later, a lot of you are new to the world of options. You're looking for a home to listen to this stuff. It's available on every platform under the sun, on demand, more of them all the time. If you're listening on demand, uh, all we ask is that you, if you like what you hear, keep rating and reviewing. It does help the tsunami of new folks discovering options find a path to our door. Of course, if you want to go above and beyond, you want to get the live throughout the week as well as, of course, all of the exclusive content coming your way, pro Q&As, options oddities, a whole bunch more. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go to join the coolest, dare I say it, secret club in the world of options. And remember, however you listen live after the fact, we love to hear from you folks. So hit us up, questions, comments, insights, pearls of wisdom, play along in our questions of the week over there at options. And then it's a, it's a two-way street, these shows. So we love to hear your questions, your comments, because it helps us know what's going on with you folks out there. And let's see what's going on with our cohorts and partners in crime. First, let's go out to the dark and stormy shores of Maine. Always overcast, always dreary, always imposing. Where we slowly pan down the beach and up to the imposing fortress like Jovanazzi compound. Where we see none other than the rock lobster himself lording over his provincial territory there on the shores of Maine. Mr. Rock Lobster, welcome back to the program, sir. How's that for an intro? I, I've never, I, I, I'm dumbfounded by that intro. That, that, is, that is the intro of all intros, I believe, at least, at least for me on this show. I was setting it up kind of like the intro to a screenplay, and I was setting the stage for you there, sir. It, yeah. it was, it was, you know, it was very, very nice. Although I guess we have a small, we have a small cliff to go up not a big sandy beach like in Rebecca, you know, that uh, quite fantastic old time, uh, uh, sure, uh, what was his name? Um, Alfred Hitchcock movie, way, way, way back when. But yes, I know that's that's what 
you you bring that up. You call it forth, I guess. I think that was an interesting opening scene. I would watch that movie. See, was what's up with this rock lobster character? What's he going to do? Why is this fortress like <laughs> compound so imposing? These are the questions you have watching that intro scene, and we want to know more. So these are the questions that will be lingering. Perhaps they will be answered throughout the show. We shall find out as we also toss it over now to a quiet, a tranquil, a land known as St. Charles, where we used to think the folks over there were upstanding, fine American citizens, kind of like your Main Street USA, kind of reliable salt of the earth folks, come to find out on Monday that St. Charles is just a bastion of ne'er-do-wells and skullduggery. And in the middle of that, coordinating all of that chaos, none other than Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Manager. Uncle Mike, I would say welcome back to the program, but you know what you've done, sir, and now you have to live with it. Okay, so you've upset a lot of people in St. Charles. I mean, there's a lot of outrage going because first you accused them a couple of years ago. I think, what was it, of the town having dysentery or something like that? And uh, I think now you're, you're, you're accusing me and my hometown of skullduggery? Um, these are baseless claims of election fraud, road warriors, 72% demolition, 11%. The people have spoken. We will get to those results. We know, we know what the true answer was. We shall get to that. And by the way, I never said dysentery. I do believe it was rickets, sir. So put that in your pipe and smoke it as we keep on rolling right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Trading Block, the portion of the show where we hold court on what the heck is lighting up our screens out there today. And you know what? It's pretty firmly in the green. There's no meandering. There's no kind of hemming and hawing today. There's no, well, maybe we want to rally. Oh, wait, no, there we go. Back to the dark side and no kind of hanging out, unched, none of that. It's pretty firmly in the green today, listeners. S&P is the Goldilocks, only up about 1.5%. NASDAQ's up 1.6%, a little more than that now. And uh, the Dow, a little over one and a third percent closing in on 1.4% out there. So, You know, all the concerns people had earlier in the week, inflation, high energy costs, all the other things, of course, still the looming malaise of the pandemic and the impact on global logistics and all these other things, Washington kerfuffles, all these pushed to the wayside now as the markets are back firmly in the green again today. That means our old friends on the vol and vol related screens are taking a bit of a break today. VIX coming into the start of the show was right around 17 and a half. That puts it down about one and a quarter points. From this time last show, VVIX, the vol of vol, coming in as well. 106, that's down about two points from Monday's show. VXX getting its erosion back on, down to about 23 and about a quarter or so when we kicked off the show. That's down a little over a point, about one and a quarter points from this time on Monday. UVXY down the same amount, down about one and a quarter points as well. It was right around 1875. Yes, it's broke through the 20 handle, listeners. 18. And three quarters when we kicked off the show. So, man, that erosion has been kicking into high. It shows you why those UVXY Jan 10 puts have been so bid for pretty much the entirety of the year <laughs> over there. It's because we're already in the teens, listeners. And Vol Q, a.k.a. the At The Money Vol of NASDAQ at about 17, pretty much even to kick off the show. Puts it down nearly three points, about two and three quarters points from this time last week. So a lot of ease on the vol screen that means let's go out back to the dark and stormy shores of maine where again we have all these questions are swirling what is going on in this very foreboding fortress-like compound and also why is vol doing what it's doing let's chat with the rock lobster and see if we can find out the answer to all of those questions sir well uh why is vol do- that's a you know that's a good question um um so, you know, you look at this sometimes and you say, what is making us rally? And it's still that ever since the Fed got highly involved in the markets, it feels like bad news is good news. So we have very high inflation and very high inflation. Like, you know what that means? That means it's a party. You have a stock party. <laughs> you buy stocks because the Fed's not going to start tapering. And All is right with the world. Exactly. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtains. It's 
Uh, and you got a one and a half percent rally. So in terms of like a vol move, um, that's way more than a 17 ball. Uh, it's a little, it's actually closer to a 24 ball actually. <laughs> so it, it does hit like the VIX, like bang, you know, it's harder for it now to move up. The liquidity providers are like, whoa, 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 you know, okay. So, you know, there's vol down per strike a little bit. I was just looking through it today. Um, how much, of course, I don't have my skewelator up because we had our big money show and I didn't really have time to get it set up. Uh, which would add a little more value to your listeners, I believe, if I actually covered it. Um, but uh, as I look at uh, uh, vol now, so the new at the money vol for SPX, let's take a look. So the new at the money vol, uh, so yesterday was 337 and today it's 353. So I know it's going to like blow people's mind away, but the new at the money, the 330, the 4430 option, the IV is actually up on that strike for the day, um, fractionally. But because VIX, because SP, the way VIX is designed, as it moves up, the Vega weighting kind of goes down because all those, the other balls are cheaper on the upside. That will automatically push VIX down. But I mean, on a per strike basis, that's again, that's why I was starting to look at money. Is I just finally getting to it today? Um, uh you have you're not actually getting a lot of per strike move now the old at the money ball was the let's call it 4430 so 43 4360 so the 4360 ball is let me see here and again that is unchanged on the day from 1590 uh actually down a little bit it's down a little bit so for 1590 to 1545 so you actually had a little, uh, what I would call, a little curve compression today. Not a lot, um, but a little bit uh, out basically in the 30-day options. So what does that all mean for listeners? Um, uh, what it means is that volatility in SPX itself has not moved a whole lot today. Um, again, it not you're not getting the aggressive selling uh of options especially on a move like this maybe some people taking profits and calls but the upside vol really didn't come in very much um so again relief rally all that kind of stuff but the liquidity providers don't see any reason to really take the ball down for strike although vix is down on the day uh based on the way it's calculated what you will see though is you'll see all the sigmas and all those numbers and like if you're using live vol and uh some platforms that actually show you vol you know, you're, you've moved up so far that vol is much lower um, near the money um, than it was yesterday because the old at the money vol was 70 points lower than it is today. Um, so you're getting all that all that action. Um, so anyway, uh, from a vol point of view, that's what we have. And we're still in bizarro land. But uh, that 4,400 number, I think Tusa has uh, talked about it quite a bit, is still uh, very resilient. It is the Number the market likes to bounce around, as it were. Bizarro land indeed. You could take that and apply that to pretty much every single day and week for the past year and a half. We've all been living in a collective bizarro land. Will we awaken one day? We shall find out as we head on out now to, again, the quiet, the sleepy, the tranquil shores of St. Charles there on the Fox River. The niceness belies the skullduggery that is lurking within as we turn to uncle mike sir uncle mike we know now to take everything you say here with a grain of salt but that said that admonishment given to the audience what is lighting up your tape full of skullduggery sir <laughs> lighting up my tape full of skullduggery uh with this uh, what i'm seeing today is that what I really liked about today is the fact that we were able to go positive on the week in the S&P 500. I think that's a good sign for the market. I think that with what we're doing on here, what we're going to have to do to see some continuation is, I hate to say it, but we're either going to we're, we're going to have to hold above the 4400 mark in the SPX. Uh, we were just below it last week at the close, but I think we're going to have to hold above it. I think it is a key number. We're getting some buying in the 10-year note. So the other thing that is a concern to me is the fact that we are getting a little bit of a rally in the 10-year note. So 
We have uh, silver higher. We have the 10-year note higher. We have the S&P 500 higher. So there's a lot of buying going on, and the money's going to uh, come out of something a lot of times uh, in the near future, whenever we have everything that's totally green besides that of the VIX. So I do have a hard time believing that uh, the reason that we're getting all this bullishness everywhere else, it seems, is because of everybody selling their VIX products at this stage. So um, with that being said, though, uh, we're not getting major moves in the 10-year note, which is a good thing uh, for the, this rally, I believe. And I think that just with where we're going to go with it, uh, it just depends on where we close today and tomorrow. I think these are very important closes uh, for what we're looking to do on it. Now, the other thing that's a benefit of this, and uh, to kind of add to a little bit of what Andrew said on the VIX, is the fact that we are coming down on this a little bit. And until people want to get rid of their uh, long put options, then a lot of times it does kind of stop the market from rallying, unless, of course, it's a global pandemic, 2020, 2021, uh, then that doesn't seem to stop it. But I think it is a pretty good sign today, the fact that we do have a VIX that's down a buck fifty about. Uh, so that's what I'm seeing right now. Uh, we'll be interesting to see going into earnings season over the course of the next couple of weeks uh, with where we go with this market. And then the other thing to bring up is the fact that we are – uh, and I like to bring it up every year is that we are approaching the anniversary of uh, the great stock market crash of 87. So that is kind of a key day. Not a ton of things happen on that every day, but uh, I think it was just such a landmark event that we need to be wary of it. We do. We need to be wary of many things, including those folks coming out of St. Charles as we keep on rolling out there. Let's see what the market is. It wary or is it diving headfirst and just embracing this rally with a whole bunch of volume? Let's find out. And again, it kind of depends where you're looking. Pretty active day, though, pretty much across the board. Let's start in VIX land as we are wont to do. Closing in on 350,000 contracts right now, about 344 on the tape. That's a pretty robust day. That's more than we've seen many days entirely <laughs> out there in VIX options land of late. Uh, the ADV right now, right around 450,000 contracts out there, about 447. Uh, so about 100K away from that. A pretty active day in VIX land, all things considered, even though it's obviously not quite a the 1 million days we have seen a few times over the course of the last few months. SPY doing some more paper out there. Three and three quarters million or so contracts on the tape right now. Uh, the ADV is about 5.7 million out there. So still a ways to go to hit that ADV, but a lot of paper on the tape. Nonetheless, right around midday here, S closing in on a million contracts, 965,000 contracts. Kind of the, the stealth story of the last few months has been this, this just resurgence of S paper out here. The ADB now up to 1.7 million. You're not that long ago, listeners. It was struggling to maintain a million out there. And yes, again, that's a huge, huge, beefy contract. So put up those kind of numbers. There's a lot of quote unquote notional value. I hate that term, but say lovey <laughs> going up out there in the S. So something worth paying attention to the Q's at about 1.1 million contracts out there. And now the ADB about 1.65 million or so. And a small caps also playing along today, 375,000 contracts on the tape in IWM land. The ADV about 592. If you want to know more about small caps, diving into rut and all that fun stuff. Probably some metals and some other fun stuff, maybe some ags and everything else popping off in a little bit. Actually, because the uh, Lord of Skullduggery there demanded it, we have to move our TWIFO schedule. So actually, we'll be doing it immediately after the option blocks. You folks out there in the secret club out there today don't have to wait at all for TWIFO. So you can thank the Skullduggery King, Uncle Mike, for that coming at you immediately after the option block at uh, 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern, about 40 minutes or so. From now, let's move on out to the most actives out there. Pretty active day, all things considered. Cost you about 228,000 contracts to break into the top 10 today. That gets you to Facebook. Again, the on again, off again <laughs> love affair with Facebook out there. Lately, a lot of it has been off again. I haven't looked today to see where it's trading, but it's doing 228,000 contracts. Good for number 10 out there. Number nine, plug power back in our top 10 there with 233,000 contracts. Number eight, Microsoft fighting its way back into the top 10 today, 247,000 contracts. Number seven, it's Ford. Is it a meme stock? Is it not a meme stock? Who knows 
All we know, it's off about a dime today, about 15, 40 or so. And good for nearly 300,000 contracts, 294 for number seven. Number six, Bank of America. We got Bank Week kicking off here on the earnings season. We'll get to that in a few minutes here. But Bank of America right now, 353,000 contracts. And number six on our top 10. This, if this was like a year ago, we would look for its symbol twin, which is Boeing. But Boeing, not really a top 10 player these days anymore. Instead, it's the other symbol twinology of uh, AMD and AMC, which, spoiler alert, going to be here in a little bit. <laughs> number five, NVIDIA. 429,000 contracts. Everyone's wringing their hands about ships. That means NVIDIA still going to be in the top 10 somewhere. Today is number five. Number four, half of the symbol twins, AMD. 565,000 contracts. Number three, right behind it, it's sibling there, AMC. 626,000 contracts. AMC, back on fire. We were just talking about this on Options Boot Camp yesterday and all these crazy things that people assume are normal now in the market. And these, these endless short squeezes is one of them. And AMC is going through yet another leg of those, up about 6.5% today, trading over 40 bucks and good for 626,000 contracts. So apparently the new normal is short squeezes never end, listeners. <laughs> number two, it's Tesla, 643,000 contracts. And number one, once again, with kind of a slight bullet, it's Apple. It does enough to retain the throne. But that's about it, 851,000 contracts. Usually on an active day like this, we could expect to see Apple well north of a million contracts. Not so much the case out there today. And, you know, you've been asking, you've been waiting patiently for a new round of earnings move, earnings move results, and earnings season reports. We just finished up the last season. We have all that data available for you right now over there at theoptionsinsider.com. Click on the Options News and Articles tab to begin your journey to the dark side. And now, I am pleased to say, hot off the presses, we have the newest iteration, the latest round of earnings move results reports for you, kicking off this brand new season. It's exciting. It's like a new car. You have that new car smell. This time it's new season. What do we have this week? A whole bunch of financials and some pizza. <laughs> Wednesday, J.P. Morgan Chase, Delta Airlines, BlackRock also have some airlines floating around out there, obviously. Thursday, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, City. Domino's Pizza, Alcoa, Morgan Stanley, and U.S. Bank Corp. Tomorrow, Friday, we have Goldman, Chucky Schwab, and PNC. And we already have earnings move results reports for some of those names. Let's start with one of the old school symbol twins, Bank of America. Like I said, they're putting up some numbers today. They popped off this morning before the bell. They went into their announcement 4314. That's where they were trading. They were priced, let's see, they were pricing in... 2.8%, and they delivered 2.5%. So a bit of a shrug for that one out there. Let's go out to one of my favorite names, the Walgreens Boots Alliance. Sounds like it's straight out of Star Wars. Who are they, or Star Trek probably, who are they allying against? These are the questions we have out here. But WBA trading right now 47 and a quarter as of this report. They were pricing in 5.2%. Oh, now this is, this is what we've come to expect from earnings season in the pandemic, listeners. They delivered 0.9%. <laughs> so a whole bunch of nothing. Yeah, that's about what we have come to see out here cycle after cycle. Let's go to Domino's and Pizza. We were just saying, man, Pizza Ball was through the roof, and they pretty much cut it in half coming into this cycle. They, they took a whole bunch of juice out of this one. Domino's Pizza popping off before the bell today. 476 and a quarter. That's where they were trading. Talking about pizza. Pizza Ball. Wow. That's some lofty pizza valuation. Uh, let's see. They were pricing in 6%. And uh, that's after they had reduced it dramatically. They had pretty much cut that straddle almost in half, listeners. They were close to probably somewhere between 10 and 12% of what they were pricing in in previous cycles. Uh, and this time, looks like that was the right move, listeners. So far, they have delivered 0.8%. So ugh, not the rousing start to earnings season that perhaps we were hoping for. I know Matt, who's, you know, they're crunching the numbers all the time. We just had him on the uh, hot seat for your pro Q&A on Tuesday there. He's all excited for this season. He thinks this season is really going to be the inflection point, the moment where the worm turns, listeners. Ah, so far, the early results, <laughs> not promising. I see pretty much nothing but red here in all, in all of these names that, that are popped off here in this earning. The only one that has any real demonstrable green looks like is United Health Group. Their ticker symbol is UNH. They were trading four or three and a half coming into their announcement. They were pricing in 3.3%. They delivered 5%. So that's pretty much 
really the only outperformance on here. Wow, everything else is red and dramatically red. Well, so far, <laughs> not off to a resoundingly good start, but uh, we shall see. We shall see. Obviously, we don't really have an earnings season report yet because the season has just begun. And if we just took those numbers, it would be pretty apocalyptic. So you don't want to hear it. <laughs> so we'll wait till we have a few more names reporting and then we'll see. We do have some more names popping off. We have Alcoa after the bell. They're at 4840. They were pricing in three and a quarter. In the past, they've moved 288. So Alcoa pricing in a little bit of juice. If you've seen what's going on across the commodity spectrum, you probably can't argue with that. Uh, J&J next week on the 19th before the bell, 159 and a quarter is where they were trading. They're pricing in 380. In the past, they moved 261. So we're starting to see some glimmers of hope here for more outperformance. Uh, P&G, let's see, 142.11 is where they were trading. They're on 19th before the bell next week as well. They're pricing in about three bucks. In the past, they moved 292. So not a heck of a lot of extra juice there. Just scrolling through. We got a whole bunch of tickers popping off next week, listeners. Uh, you can check those out for yourselves. Theoptionsinsider.com. Click on the options news and articles tab to begin your options earnings journey as we continue our journey right on into the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by theoptionsinsider.com. It's time for the odd block. everybody let's do it let us unleash the eye of sauron see where it fixes its gaze today let's kick things off going back to a name we haven't talked about in a while this is apa this is the holding company for a name we used to make appearances on the show every now and then apache they're out there in the old hydrocarbon exploration game and they're trading right now at 2581 ticker symbol apa a year ago, it was trading about 920. We all know what's going on in the hydrocarbon area over the course of the last year. A lot of upside. And we see a lot of that in this chart as well. So they're trading about nine bucks and change last year. By March 5th, they had risen to 23 and a quarter. That's a nice run for them. And they gave some of that back. I down to about 17 again in April. Then rallied again up to 23 and a half. And kind of, that was in June. Then kind of gave that up again by August, August 19th to 20th they were trading right about exactly 16 bucks and then they since the 20th of august they've really begun this next leg up and gotten all the way up to pretty much where they are right now uh, 2607 i think they hit that actually today is their 52 week high so they're pretty much at their 52 week high right now for good old apache aka apa easy for me to say <laughs> what did our eye of sauron found i know you guys loved some old school swing for the fences upside. The Eye of Sauron knows that as well, which is why it's delivering some old school call love for us today in APA to kick things off. Get your juices flowing, listeners. And today we noticed 10,114 of the Nov 27 halves. So even beyond, pretty far beyond that 52 week high of right around 26 bucks. They paid pretty much 105 for these things. So that was through the offer. They were offered at 103. Only 362 were offered there. They said, we need 10,000. So got to go all the way up to 105. But they got them. That's about a 57 vol. So that's a lot of vol. The stock was actually a little bit lower when they bought these. It was about 25.46. So it has rallied a little bit since then. So by using the Rock Lobster's limited metric of, are they bid out after you buy them? <laughs> the answer is going to be yes for these because the stock has moved uh, pretty decently. They are getting earnings in this if you're wondering why they're so juicy that's because earnings are on november 3rd here so that's going to add a little bit of juice to the squeeze there and they decided i guess they like these a lot because they came back in later and did six thousand more a total of about sixteen thousand of these bad boys have traded on the day at least kicking off the show i haven't checked maybe more have gone up since then so intriguing stuff mr rock lobster it feels good it feels right to kick off the odd block with kind of the oldest of old school paper, the just straight up swing for the fences by a near term call well beyond the 52 week 
a high here. Buy it through earnings and let the dice fly, sir. What do you say? Um, I would say that's a good uh, that that's a good read on that call purchase. <laughs> um, I, I will. I, I do have uh, a little. I have to question your analysis though on Walgreens. Um, it has had a ten percent swing in price today. See these earnings move results reports. Like I said, they're hot off the presses, so they take kind of the initial blush of what happens immediately after the announcement kind of thing. So right pretty much on the open is kind of how they calculate these because uh, they, okay. they have yeah, to crunch all was- they have to crunch all the numbers and get them out to people like us, right? So it's not an ongoing measure. I've always said if you uh, okay, if you expand okay. that so- frame of reference, you probably can get a better result. But in the it, all they want to measure is kind of the initial earnings coming out of it, right? And uh, in that so sense, that's that's what we what got. What you might laugh about on the Walgreens earnings report is they say they're going to close stores where they don't enforce laws. <laughs> oh, interesting. So pretty <laughs> much, either. pretty much the entirety of the southern USA is going to be deprived of the Walgreens Boots Alliance. Well, well, places where there's no like you could shoplift without penalty. <laughs> so the the stock was actually down this morning. So. Again, I don't know if that's exactly true because I heard it from Mark, but I don't know if he was just saying that's what they're doing, why the stock was down or something. But anyway, uh, but it's up four. I mean, it's up eight percent right now, and it was down probably two, two and a half bucks. It was trading forty five this morning. Anyway, um, but Apache is a swing for the fences, and I have to tell you, um, uh, it makes it. I don't have a position in Apache, but I have a lot of uh, oil stocks. Um, I did hear an interesting stat from somebody who is, a, uh, I think, a, a pretty good, good-sized hedge fund manager. And when oil rallies, when they le- leads the market, they think that's bearish for the market overall. I wonder if a, one of the uh, listeners could confirm that. But it, it doesn't sound like a far-fetched idea to me. You know, normally when oil prices are skyrocketing, everything else is kind of bad. Um, but of course, we're in bizarre world, so that's not happening today. So just everything goes up. Everything goes up. I can't see a scenario where that isn't probably bad for the market, right? If oil leads it up, <laughs> it used to be the lifeblood of the market, a little bit less now, but still very much the lifeblood of things. So it doesn't really help outside of the hydrocarbon immediate space. It doesn't really help the rest of the names out there. Let's say shipping, airlines, all of them already leaning on the $80 oil to, as an excuse for their earnings. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see that stat bear fruit if you crunch the numbers. If you are going to crunch the numbers out there, hit us up, let us know. But that sounds like something I would, I could easily, uh, I could easily see. And by the way, just a reminder, I, like, obviously the Rock Lobster was confused. Maybe some of you are as well. Those earnings move results reports are kind of taken immediately after the announcement, right around the opening bell time. So you can kind of see exactly how much move you're getting instantly over. If you hold them for a longer period, for hours or sometimes through expiration, you can have a different result, obviously. So just bear that in mind. All right. Uh, looks like we have our, our chat. Looks like uh, Mr. Unlimited saying it's going to happen in California and New York, where, where maybe the Walgreens Boots Alliance is doing their deal. I don't know. I need to dig into that some more. Speaking of digging in, let's do that now, listeners. Let's dive into the Wayback Machine and go all the way back to mid-July, listeners. In this case, I still have WBA up because I just love looking at Walgreens Boots Alliance, but that's not where we're going, listeners. We're going to another W name, Wells Fargo, ticker symbol WFC. At the time, it was around July 14th, and we profiled on the show, listeners, what looked like a pretty sizable collar going up in good old WFC. At the time, the stock was almost exactly 45 bucks, 44.99. And we saw someone coming in and gobbling up the October. So they were going out a little ways. This was July, obviously, when this trade went up. They gave themselves some time. They picked up 12,000 of the AK 47 half double, so the 55 vertical. And then against that, it looks like they also, I should say actually, it looks like if that was a collar, obviously they would have sold that. And then uh, they would have bought the puts for about 55 cents, which was they were lifting the offer on the puts. And one of the things that made this a little bit dubious is, of course, a couple of things going on. It was it could have been closing on the 47 half, so they could have been rolling to the doubles. That would be weird if you were going to roll up and also pick up the put at the same time. <laughs> uh, so 12,000 across the board of this collar slash risk reversal. I believe we had some debate on the show as to exactly what the heck they were doing out there at the time. It was about a 30 vol on the 47 halves and about a 35 vol that they were lifting the offer on on those 37 half puts there. So if it is a collar, 
They bought themselves some downside, and they still actually got a credit on this because they sold that call spread for over a buck. So intriguing stuff here. Maybe they put the collar on for a 72-cent credit if that's the case. Again, there are worse things to get paid for your protection. Uh, and it looks like this one is one of those, in that weird scenario, because if you have the collar listeners, particularly a collar with a call spread there, then you know you only have a couple of areas where nothing really happens. And that's kind of where we're hanging out right now. Coming into showtime, Wells Fargo is a little bit shy of 45 and a half, about 45, 44. And so that puts it below that 47 and a half strike, obviously. So that upside vertical is not really kicking in. So you're not dumping any stock against this. And also you're put it's kind of just hanging out <laughs> for the 37 half strike. Not really doing much there either. Let's see. Looks like they like this so much. They came back in and traded 20,000 more a few weeks later on July 28th. That was tied to stock almost exactly here, 45 half. So the stock net on these last few months has done absolutely nothing. It's pretty much exactly where, <laughs> where this trade went up. It looks like they were still open. And let's see, I just pulled up the stats for these 47 halves while we were talking. There's still 53,000 of the OC 47 halves open on this strike. So I guess it kind of depends, Mr. Rock Lobster, how you interpret this, if they're actually doing all right right now. Because they said we're outside the kind of zone of both of the wings of this trade. So they're both kind of worthless, which means that they did this for a credit. They're making, uh, looks like somewhere around 800, 860K or something in that ballpark. Depends on, again, how much they did the second kind for. I'll have to go look and see. They did it tied to stock, though. But again, the stock hasn't budged. So the stock is a non factor in this trade. So it seems like they did a whole bunch of contracts to do kind of a whole lot of nothing on the stock, Mr. Rock Lobster. And if they did do it as a collar financed by the vertical, then they ended up making money. What are your thoughts on this? You think that's what they did? Um, this has the potential whiff of, uh, you know, like a lot of the stock, buy the puts and then sell the, uh, call spread against it type of trade. Does that, you know, that seems like it, a, that seems like it. Yes. But crazier uh, things yeah. have happened. Maybe they bought it all. Who knows? It was a stupid with a put. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, they bought, or they bought the call spread versus the put. So they're paying, you know, 180 for the strangle. Um, which right now doesn't look that good trading 4538. So yeah, you know what Wells Fargo has been? I think it's been a great buy right because it's the stock that Elizabeth Warren loves to hate. Those bad bankers, you know. So anyway, um it, it's uh and look, you know what another thing too is I think the banks are saying, hey, you know, we're making money, but I think they're mostly this year just taking the reserves they put on in for, uh, you know, COVID. Um, and they're just, you know, they can, they can report them now as, you know, they're making their earnings look better. So it's, I, I think this was a, this was a fun stock to buy when it was in the low thirties, I think uh, maybe even in the high twenties, I can't remember, but now, you know um, I think it's like kind of a buy right wheel style style stock. Uh, it's just kind of hard, even with like, you know, uh, it should be a decent year uh, for Wells Fargo. But I just they've never quite found their way <laughs> after those problems. So anyway, that's kind of my take on Wells Fargo. It's, uh, yeah, those uh, all those scandals did kind of make them the public whipping boy for everyone who hates all things banking. They do tend to turn to, yes. to Wells Fargo and not undeserved for a lot of that stuff. Uh, there, you're right. So this one's kind of a weird one. A lot of this is still open. It kind of depends how you interpret this, listeners. It is interesting to see if they did sell the vertical against the puts. Usually we see sell the call and buy the put, and that's the collar. The, the fact if he did buy the doubles, he did have some concern, or she, that the stock could continue rallying. Otherwise, why else would you buy the doubles to get back in, right? Uh, so he did spend an additional 36 cents 12,000 times against uh, some upside move, which obviously did not materialize. The stock has done a whole lot of nothing. So yeah, from that analysis, this is a great buy right stock because it has not budged in three months, <laughs> at least net. So yeah, it looks like I'm going to go out on a limb and say this guy probably put on the collar listeners. He still did it for a credit either way. So he's still looking all right, but he could have, he could have bought the stupid or the strangle like, like the rock lobster was saying, in which case he's out a whole bunch of dough. Either way, it's all still open, and Wells Fargo has done a whole lot of nothing, which generally is not conducive 
to uh, this type of trade. So intriguing stuff here. And then let's go out to a little bit more straightforward one now to wrap up our roundup here. Let's go to August 30th to Global Star. They are a low earth satellite company for sat phones and ticker symbol GSAT, G S A T. You guys love your cheapies. And we gave you one back on August 30th to the tune of somebody loving themselves some GSAT calls. They picked up 7,684 of the three calls back when the stock was trading 219. And this is the cheapy listeners. They paid 40 cents for these. <laughs> Gotta love those. Gotta love those. Oh, uh, where's the where's the viceroy when you need them? They lifted the offer. This is a 205 volatility, listeners. Ah, uh, yes. That's those are the numbers we love to see. The the high triple digits in volatility. <laughs> so the earnings are not till November. And yeah, this one is looking no bueno, listeners. The stock right now coming into showtime is oh a buck 60 <laughs> so a far cry shall we say from the uh, the levels that they uh, that was trading even when they put this trade on let's just look really quickly and see how high it got over that period oh you know what they had a nice pop they had a nice pop a little over a month ago september 8th the stock got up to looks like it's 52 week high oh my goodness it looks like it got nearly there 52 week high is 298 let's let's just make sure let's go all the way back a year to see Oh, uh, no, that could have been back in February as well. It had two pops up to during the day, closing right around 262. Looks like here it closed on September 8th at 269. I'm guessing that was the day it got up to 52-week high of 298. So that's the case. They had their chance, listeners. They had their chance to get the heck out of Dodge. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so... Yeah, they did not because looks like the OI is there's 93,000 of these things still open. And unlike you might assume the day when it rallies to three bucks on September 8th, they would maybe take a whole bunch of these bad boys off because it got there. No, looks like they traded 123,000 more and they added 101,000 to the OI on this strike. Uh, so yeah, unlike uh, unlike taking your money and getting while the getting is good, they bought more. It seems like on that day the options closed at forty two cents, so they could have just uh, broken even on them and said get the heck out of Dodge. But they said no, we'll take more. And unfortunately, that was not the right trade, listeners. <laughs> Mister Rock Lobster, how many times do we have to say it? You buy premium, the stock goes your way. You got to get the heck out of Dodge on at least some of it, right? Well, I, that's the thing with buying options. I mean, it's it's not it's not a thirty year purchase. You know, you've got <laughs> you got till the fifteenth. So, um, uh, I that's why I, you know, we we say that for a reason because how many times have you seen your account with all this flashy green happening and then <laughs> it just goes away? Um, so, I I I feel. Uh, I feel like this GSAT person, uh, they got to go, you know, um, it's, <laughs> they didn't, if you don't take your money, what are you going to do? That's all. How, how many times are you going to say it? So a lot of my students, when they come to me, you know, actually it was somebody just asked the question today, should I take the money? I go, and, <laughs> and I think the p- position was up way over a hundred percent. So yeah, yeah, you should take it or at least take half, you know, so that way you don't feel, uh, you know, totally bad about the whole thing. Yeah, at least take some. We've said it before, and it's not like a broken record, but no one ever went broke taking a profit, or in this case, scratching what had been a loser. Yeah, once again, this is kind of the the tail of the tape in the premium buying land. How many of these trades have we talked about now, listeners, where they went their way, they got the move they wanted, and they still did nothing. So, <laughs> all right, let's keep on rolling. See what you folks have to say. It is time for the mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody, let's get to it. Let's kick things off with our question of the week this week, and not the skullduggery. We'll get into that a little bit later if we have time. Uh, But our actual question of the week this week, listeners, is an interesting one. I like all of our questions of the week, but the data for this one, I think, is is extremely fascinating. And we asked you, we said, you know, we've seen an explosion of new options traders enter the market over the past year and a half. 
So it seems like a good time to ask the question, when did you start trading options? We gave you four periods slash categories to put yourself in. So post-pandemic, so you started trading options sometime in the last 18 or so months. Uh, Post-great financial crisis, again, it's up as GRC, but it should be GFC, obviously. So sometime in the you know, 2008 meltdown and a little bit after that, maybe. The dot-com bust, so sometime in that 2000 period, we'll be generous, we'll extend it all the way to 2008. Or you come from uh, the old school variety, you came into this business as like a market maker or a trader, maybe a broker, and so... You came in through the the more professional category out there. So we gave you those four choices. The voting has been hot and heavy and very interesting from the jump. Let's go out now to the land of skullduggery known as St. Charles. We are joined by Mr. Uncle Mike. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, where do you think our audience, what do you think is winning our poll right now? Which of these categories do you think is in the lead? Well, I think that we're going to say the newbies, the people that have started in the last 18 months or so, just because uh, what else are you going to do? And in terms of when I started, it was uh, shortly after I got cut from the bills and uh, I was substitute teaching to pay my bills. Uh, and I started reading every book known to man on option trading. And that's when I kind of caught the bug. So for me, it would have been, uh, I believe, 2001. So you'd have been a dot-com buster. There you go. Mr. Rock Lobster, obviously you fall into the old school professional category. Which of these categories do you think is winning, sir? Uh, I think we have, uh, I think, the, you know, the people starting since the pandemic, just because it's just uh, such explosive growth from that. Interesting. So both of you think the majority of the respondents are going to say in the last 18 months. Interesting. Very interesting. And it is a high response rate. The actual winner right now is the post-Great Financial Crisis, sometime after 2008, with about 44.6% of the respondents. But uh, hot on its heels, number two, is the post-pandemic crowd, with nearly a third, about 31% of the audience just starting to trade options in the last 18 months. That's amazing. That's awesome. It's crazy. It's all of the above. If you are one of those newcomers, check out the Options Bootcamp episode we just put up yesterday, listeners, because you kind of break down some of the things that maybe you might think are normal because you haven't seen anything different. <laughs> and we kind of break it down. These are not normal. You should not expect this over the long term. So check out that episode if you are new. It's an important one, I think. Uh, the dot-com bus period, sometime in that 2000 to 2008 time frame, nearly 15% and about 10% for the pro crowd in our audience. I know we got a lot of the pros floating around out there. A lot of you, uh, like Grid Vision says it's a fascinating poll. I agree. This is a, a fascinating poll. I love to see some of the you know, demographic data on when you folks actually got into this uh, kind of stuff. Speaking of polls, we know there was some skullduggery earlier this week. Listen, we won't have to rehash all of it again. Oh, Nichols in the chat room. He wants to know why Uncle Mike had to buy votes. I, you know, I agree. You know, it was a painful period for all of us. Luckily, fortunately, we were able to reconcile that. Again, there was a lot of issues with that first poll. You know, Uncle Mike, you, we, we won't have to rehash that. Instead, instead, we were able to correct it in a later edition of this. And so I am happy to now share the actual correct non-skullduggery data from our belated Uncle Mike birthday poll from earlier in the week on Monday. We said, you know, a lot of you people are clearly, we're having a hard time with that first poll due to the wave of skullduggery. So we gave him this one. And we, you know, so you'd be happy to know, Uncle Mike, in the question of is demolition the greatest pro wrestling tag team of all time? It was a tie. It was, it was a hotly contested race. But it came down to a three-way tie between yes, undoubtedly, and was there ever a doubt. Each of those with 33.3% of the vote. Ironically, no votes for but of course. I thought that one might actually run away with it. So I'm pleased to say that is the actual winner of our belated Uncle Mike birthday poll. The, it's a tie, a three-way tie between yes, undoubtedly, and was there ever a doubt for is Demolition the greatest tag team of all time? We also had a write-in vote with some weird guy called the Rock Lobster. He wrote in Crockett and Tubbs. <laughs> Mr. Rock Lobster, is that, your, is that your view of a tag team, Crockett and Tubbs? <laughs> uh, you know, one of the greatest teams of all time, in my opinion, but I'm dating myself. I'm dating myself. You're a boat guy. Do you ever have an alligator on your boat? I did not. What was this alligator call? I forgot, like... Randy or Frosty? Oh, the or alligator or had a name. I don't. I don't Elvis. remember. Elvis. Oh, it was, was called Elvis. Wow. I don't. Even, I don't remember that. I just remember he had an alligator on his boat. That's all. Uh, so, Uncle Mike, now that we've seen the clarified 
non-manipulated data. Do you feel a little better about yourself, sir? I feel I already felt better because the Road Warriors are undefeated every time they wrestled the demolition. So, like I said in, in the response to that, which I think you deleted on Twitter, was that you can have a poll saying who do, who do you like better, the Chiefs or the Buccaneers? But it doesn't matter. The Buccaneers have the Super Bowl trophy; they're the better team, and the Road Warriors are undefeated in their entire career versus the demolition. Thus, they're the best. And on top of that. In the real poll, we, the Road Warriors won 72 to 11. I will say this. There obviously is a, a depth of interest in the Road Warriors out in your neck of the woods. It does seem like there is a preponderance of, of Midwestern accounts flocking in for the, the Road Warriors, which to me is interesting because just as an aside, <laughs> I obviously grew up in the kind of motherland of WWF back in the day, which was, you know, I was like 30, 40 miles from Stanford, which was their HQ. Obviously, WWF was predominantly a Northeastern promotion when it started. So that tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, was pretty much all WWF all the time. So we got it beamed into our brains very early. But even as a kid growing up, when we would debate the greatest, these are the debates you would have on the playground back in the 80s, you know, the names were thrown out there. Of course, Demolition. I would always fight for them. You'd have the Heart Foundation. Maybe you have some silly ones like the Bushwhackers, or maybe you throw in some weird ones. Maybe you throw the Powers of Pain in just for weird, or maybe the Rockers and the old school thing, or you get some other silly ones in there, the Rougeos. Who knows? Never once in any of these, any of these times did anyone mention or even acknowledge the existence of the Road Warriors. So it's kind of weird. I think it must be must be like a Midwestern thing. You guys obviously got a healthy dose out here. I forgot what prom- whatever that promotion Ric Flair was in. Obviously, that's where the Road Warriors were. And that's obviously you folks in the Midwest have a, have a tie to this team that, quite frankly, the rest of the world that was living in the WWF probably doesn't even really know about. I never heard of them until I saw the Dark Side of the They're Ring. They're WWE Trump. Hall of Famers. Now they are, yes. They're now the they WWE are. WWE Hall of Fame. The I'm, demolition are not. Well, we know why that is. That that's a whole other story. <laughs> if you're not Vince's buddy, and the demolition, let's say, did not exactly end on the on the greatest of terms with Vince. Hence the addition of Crush and all the other stuff that we will not discuss. Axe and Smash only. There will never be any Crush here. But just putting that out there, listeners. If you were concerned about uh, the skullduggery that was unleashed by the hordes of Uncle Mike, it was corrected, and uh, the true answer is a three way tie. Between, yes, undoubtedly, and was there ever a doubt for uh, demolition? Let's keep on rolling here. Oh, this is a funny one. Melvy, let's wash the Uncle Mike taste from our mouths, Uncle listeners, uh, and, and the, the skullduggery there. This is the silly one. Melvy says, have you guys seen the scene in Squid Game where the player is sent to the games for using, quote, derivatives? Priceless. Yeah, we talked about this. Someone else mentioned this on Twifo last week. I have seen I've watched the whole show now. It's apparently... I guess the rest of the world has as well. It's now like the number one hit show on all of Netflix, something crazy like that. But you're right. There is a scene and it stuck out to me as well. One of the players is you're pretty much they're trying to label him as a bad guy and why he got sent to these horrible games. And it's because he defrauded a lot of clients and and took their money. He was a money manager. But then they said he took it. And to prove he was how evil he was, he put it in derivatives. <laughs> and that was supposed to be like the, the gasp, the shock line of the show. Like, oh, my God, send that man to the murder games. He's obviously a terrible person. They do go on later to clarify that he used futures and futures options. And that was kind of a way to make it even sound worse. He said it wasn't just stocks. And it kind of is like a pause for a dramatic effect. He says, and it was futures. And the main character kind of like, oh, gasps. And the game character is kind of an idiot, doesn't really get it. But it's still, that's that's the setup of all of this, that. These awful products that if you trade them, you will be sent to the murder games in Korea. Mr. Rock Lobster, I'm assuming neither of you guys have seen this show. Have either of you guys seen this show? Uh, I have not. I have not. But I, I, it's on social media all over the place. Yeah. But I, I like the uh, – I mean, the premise sounds kind of fun, to be honest, you know. It is an extremely dark show, so do not go into it looking for a good time. <laughs> if you want to have an uproaring sit around the, the tv with the family and watch a fun time this is not the show this is a show to be consumed kind of in a dark room by yourself <laughs> and so i'm assuming uncle mike hasn't seen it either but it is a uh yes it, it was interesting to see that that's why this guy who becomes one of the main kind of antagonists of the show why he was sent to the murder games because he he had the temerity to use derivatives i thought that was a pretty funny out here. Squeeze on a few more people here really quickly. Durzo. That's like your handle. Durzo says, good afternoon. 
Well, good afternoon, Durzo. He says, which brokerage would you recommend for me to start learning to trade options using a paper trading account? Thank you. Well, kind of the default recommendation for a number of years for quality platform stuff has usually been toss. But that's getting a little bit questionable now just because of the, the Schwab integration. You know, how well is it going or not? Uncle Mike or Rock Lobster, do you guys still think toss is the best paper trading or do you guys have a new recommendation? I mean, for um, me, I mean it, toss is still a good, good platform. Uh, you could also try a uh, uh, trade hawk through uh, a tradier. They have paper trading. So, and the platform is improved. They just put out a new, uh, new version. So I would give them a try too. And they, they have an all, all you can eat price for, uh, you know, for commissions. Interesting. Mr. Uncle Mike, do you concur with that? I mean, I've, I haven't done any paper trading in many years, so I really can't comment too much on that. But I've been very happy with Toss for many years. There you go. So a couple of votes for Toss. It's kind of been the old standby Durzo, so you can't really go wrong with it. Uh, the downside is, again, we don't know how well the integration is going to go going forward. If the OX integration is any indication, that wasn't exactly smooth and seamless in that platform. They didn't really keep all the good features. So it's it's open question. Right now, you, you could do worse. Uh, there are some new players you could play with as well. As we keep on rolling, it is time to go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody. It is time to go Around the Block. Tell you what we're keeping an eye on until we gather here together on Monday Let's start in the land of the Squid Game itself. No, not South Korea. It is St. Charles, where savage business is afoot left, right, and center. Mr. Uncle Mike, what are you keeping an eye on through the weekend until Monday? Just watching to see this 4,400 mark and to see also if we can close positive on the week. Uh, we, we are having a huge day today and with the Bulls, and I want to see if we can hold the, hold the uh, positivity rate <laughs> hold the positivity in the markets for the week uh, i think that'll be a very positive thing and so with that uh watching that and watching to see if this uh small rally in the 10-year note becomes a big rally because if it does then i will be concerned about 40 holding 4400 in the s p mr rock Lobster, same question for you sir what are you watching through the weekend until monday uh, well, I mean, you got, uh, we have VIX is now uh, below 17 for the first time in a while. Um, uh, just looking gold, oil, commodities, uh, all of a sudden uh, the Qs have uh, risen from the depths a little bit here. So the earnings are coming out, you know, we have big earnings at the end of the month. So um, uh, those are, I mean, those really are the things I'm looking at to see if, uh, if this, if uh, if there's actually some real sellers involved today, uh, which it, as it appears like I don't, it does not appear that there's a ton of them yet. So I'm I'm interested to see if this rally holds. I have to be honest with you. All right, that music means we're done. But if you want more in your ear holes, listeners, you can thank Uncle Mike. You don't have to wait at all. Twifo coming up immediately after the option block this week. So enjoy your. Rear double dose of back-to-back goodness. So speaking of Uncle Mike, if folks are intrigued, Mr. Rock, Mr. Uncle Mike, I should say, and they want to hit you up to tell you who the greatest tag team in the world actually is, where should they go? What should they do? Follow me on Twitter at Mike Tussaw, T-O-S-A-W. Could use some more Twitter followers so I can hang with the big boys of uh, – of uh, the Options Insider who tried to bully me around on Twitter. But uh, need some help, folks. Help me out with that. And if you're looking for a financial advisor who is honest and loves the derivative product and views it as uh, a source of good and not a source of evil, as we just discussed, hit me up. Uh, my website is stcharleswealth.com. Better be careful. You tell people in Korea you're using derivatives, they will send you to the Squid Games, sir. stcharleswealth.com is the place to go. Get there before he gets exiled to the murder games, listeners. And Mr. Rock Lobster, as we head back to the imposing fortress-like compound, what do you wish your folks go if they want to learn more about all things Rock Lobster, sir? Yes, go to optionfit.com memberships and uh, check it out. We got a lot of products. Uh, we, we're growing like crazy gangbusters. Uh, Mark just launched uh, Big Money Flow, which is really cool. Um, you know, looking at flow, option flow, and what what uh, the block trades are doing. And uh, it's going very well. So for all those that are interested, come on by uh, optionpit.com. 
I can't keep track of all your products over there. A veritable plethora of products over there at optionpit.com to learn more. And we got to go, but not very far, listeners. If you're listening after the fact, just hit next. If you're listening live, you get a nice treat, Twifo, in your ear holes right now. Otherwise, for Option Block, we'll see you back here on Monday. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com.